and use the code 2100 to save $100 when you register if you do it by December the 10th. Uh, now, other announcements. Brother Dean, well, let's see. Um, he is going to be um, filling in for Pastor Bard in New Hampshire. Pastor Bard's daughter, Shiloh, I don't know her last name. Uh, they were missionaries, I think, in Australia. Uh, she has this cancer or the blood or whatever it is that she has, and they are not giving her uh, much longer to live. So did she pass away? I kind of didn't. What's that? Okay, I did not hear that. Okay, so the so he's going to go up to fill in for him. Uh, I'm sure the funeral is down in Texas somewhere or whatever. That's where she was in the hospital. <clears throat> uh, so he will be gone for however long uh, to do that. So if you see the deans, say hello and goodbye to them again <laughs> until they uh, get back. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to do, uh, say, in, in relation to that, and I can't remember what it was. I didn't write it down. All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, Brother Jeff is going to come and do our lesson tonight. Father, we pray for your blessing. We pray for your help. We pray for your strength. We pray for the Master's Club program as it's going on this evening, and uh, we pray that you would just bless in it, help the young people to be discipled in the things of the Lord. We continue to pray for Pastor and Alan and Pastor Boots and his boy as they're ministering in India, and we pray for that to continue and be fruitful. Thank you for the fruit that has already come, and we pray for your blessings as we uh, continue just serving you and doing uh, as we ought. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Good evening. Uh, we'll be in a few different passages this evening, um, but the main verse is a verse that we should all be familiar with. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18, I believe, is the reference. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should always be seeking to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That has to do with our relationship with Jesus. It also has to, to deal with growing in grace, meaning we're not going by our strength, the flesh, but by going in his strength. And that is something that regardless of what stage you are in in Christianity is important to remember and to continue on with. And I, part of the reason this message um, came to my heart tonight is because Apparently, I'm getting older because many people are contacting me um, more than ever um, just for spiritual advice, spiritual help, or whatnot. And I'm starting to realize that I'm not some 23-year-old, 25-year-old kid anymore that, you know, I have a responsibility. And in that, I have seen the Lord work through that in many ways. And it is when we are strong in him and we are strong in the things of the Lord and we are willing to tell people what they need to hear in love that we can see real growth. And that's not easy because sometimes you have to sort of hit people where you know it's going to hurt, and, um, but it is for their own good. So part of this is a, an encouragement to you to continue growing in grace and to not forget that. Because oftentimes we know what to do, we know what the scripture says, but we either do not remember to put it in practice or um, we think we have a better way. And um, more on that later. But there are a few reasons, I'm sure there's a, a multitude of reasons why we get to one place in our spiritual life and we either don't want to grow more or we do not grow more. 
Um, one of them is fear. You know, what is the Lord going to have me give up? Uh, what is the Lord going to require me to go to go to the next level? And quite frankly, we shouldn't be thinking about the requirements. We should be thinking about how the Lord will use us after we grow to the next level. There's a joy in that, and um, but naturally there's going to be a fear. Uh, sometimes there are people that feign or fake their spirituality. So they want to show that they're at a certain spiritual level, and they get stuck there, and if they were to admit that there was any more room to grow, then it would, might appear bad on them. It might appear that they haven't arrived yet. And as we s we'll see in the lesson, that has nothing to do with it, nothing to do with our spirituality. Um, and then sometimes we get frustrated. There are times when we grow or we know we have to grow, and then we have to get, get rid of that, that, what we've been leaning on from the past. And that's scary, uh, but can be frustrating. It can be frustrating going back and saying, well, you know, this was my theology three months ago, six months ago, but now I realize I've been elected to say something different. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and th and that, that can be humbling. Uh, but again, I'm convinced as I see growth in other people, I'm convinced that a lifelong uh, growing in grace and in knowledge of Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, is is what we need to strive for. I believe we need to stand. Um, I believe we need to uh, be still and know that he is God. There are times when we can be satisfied that we've grown from a certain level, but we shouldn't stay there too long. We should constantly be moving on. And that also can be a little stressful. I worked at Jay Riggins, which was a clothing store. Um, you might not be able to tell it by the clothes that I wear, but we were constant, every day we were getting messages through the computer at the time. It was just a register that would, telling us to move this, move that shelf, push this down. And I, I, after a while, I was like, this is every day. And I thought, certainly it's got to end. And my manager was like, no, this isn't because we're a new store, because we were a newer store. It's because every day we're going to be changing stuff because we want the store to look fresh and different and new. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Um, but in our spiritual life, it's exactly what we all need to do. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to speak for Pastor Andy. He would probably tell you, certainly he knows a lot. And certainly he's experienced the grace of God in his life. He's seen many things both in, through, and around him. That's three things. Both does not apply. But he's seen it all. But if you ask him, he would say, absolutely, I'm not gr done growing yet. And we think, well, Paul, you know, he arrived fully packed. He didn't. In fact, when he became a Christian, he had to unpack a lot of things. And as I think we'll see tonight, he, had, he, he also had to grow. So an encouragement. As devotionals will sacrifice deep theology for the practical daily living, uh, so tonight we are going to sacrifice a little bit of the deep theology and practical for an encouragement. So if you notice in this message, there's a dual strain of teaching. There's going to be two things going on at once. The primary thing is that you see that growth in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is extremely important, and it's for every Christian, no matter what level they're on. So, a foundation. 1 Corinthians 1, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13. A familiar passage. And we could spend three, four, or five messages on this one passage. But I want us to notice really one thing through it all. You know the passage. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Chari charity envies not. Charity vaunts it's not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And here's where it gets interesting. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Verse 11, again, this is the key this evening. When I was a child, remember this is Paul, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Verse 9, 10, 11, really through 13, shows us that Paul had to mature in his faith. Paul said, you know, when I was a child, I spake as a child. And this is referenced right after he speaks of three things. Three things that were important for the early church during a very pivotal time. You know, we're, we're moving away from Old Testament we're, uh, times and we're moving into uh, the apostolic times when the apostles were living. And then we're going to move into, you know, really the, the post-apostolic time with the New Testament. And uh, Paul was saying, you know, we have three things. We have tongues, which I believe are languages. And though he says here, though I speak with the tongues of angels, I, I believe he's saying, even though I would speak in the tongues of angels. Again, there's a maturity here, okay, as we'll see. And, and, and though we prophesy, and though we have knowledge, so he's speaking about how are we doing this, this Christianity thing? How are we growing? How are we evangelizing? But how are we ministering to one another before the scriptures? Uh, you know, they had tongues to speak in other languages so that they could disseminate the gospel to a wide majority of people at Acts and then beyond. And if you look at it, um, it seems, though, as though, you know, when Peter's speaking, it seems that everybody heard him in their own tongue at the same time. It's almost like it's the gift of ears. Now, there's other possibilities there. Um, there's a possibility that um, Paul was speaking and then all the 12 or 11 disciples at that time were scattered throughout and then they would preach what Paul was preaching so it got out to more people and then there were different language groups of people at different places. You know, there's all sorts of things that, that they say could happen there. We, we're not 100% sure, but the one thing we are sure of is that Paul says tongues will cease. They'll go away. Because that's no longer going to be necessary as people that now have the gospel in their language go to a foreign country and then they can speak it in their own language. Or as we have time to develop our language skills, we no longer need that gift of speaking in other languages to, to give the gospel out. So this is a very pivotal time. And there was probably some tongue speaking within the local church with an interpreter. Again, I believe that's languages. I don't think there's any other uh, explanation for what's going on. But that would have been also to hopefully build people up. And when it didn't, they said, don't do it. And so for 17, 1800 years, there, there was no record of any babbling tongues. And all of a sudden, it, it, it came back again. With prophesying and knowledge, which were spiritual gifts at the time, and still are uh, in different ways, they're talking about how, you know, if Christ is real, and if the Old Testament, you know, if he's come to fulfill the Old Testament, how then do we minister before the scriptures are here? How do we minister to one another? Well, some people had the gifts of prophecy, gifts of knowledge, then they were able to minister in special ways so that the church would grow even quicker. And, and again, Paul says, you know, um, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. 
And he says in verse 10, that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. See, during this pivotal time, there's all sorts of different things going on. But Paul was looking to a future time and growing toward the time when there would be the scriptures. And then we could solidify our faith. The one nice thing about the scriptures is over prophesying and speaking to one another is you can check them. I'm going to tell you, I thought I had a wonderful memory until the internet was available and people could check to see if my knowledge was correct or not. But I know that I say stuff to my staff and I know they come at Promise and Camp and I know they come back and say, well, you didn't say that, you, you said this. And I'm like, at this point, I don't know, okay? I don't know. I used to think I knew what I said, but now I don't. Now, if somebody says something to me, that would be unlike me saying it, I know I would not say that. So now they've got to get real crafty. What would he say? <laughs> but the scriptures, when we minister to one another, if we use the scriptures, then somebody can, you know, can go back to them like the Bereans did and say, okay, here it is, solid. And if you go to the scriptures with a humble heart and you read, the same scriptures that you've read for years and years and years all of a sudden become alive. I read the best sermon the other day. I'm going to tell you, when you prepare for a message, sometimes you read and you think, this is wonderful. I could Romans 5 through 8. All I did was read through it. And I thought, yes, yes, yes. Keep coming, keep coming. Come. You know, this, this was amazing. And it will come up later. But we have it to go back and check. So Paul is, is talking about what's going to go on in the future. He's talking about a maturity. And that which is partial will be done away with and we'll have the permanent. And then what he's saying is we will have a final revelation of Jesus. So Hebrews talks about that. So in the past, in, in sundry, sundry times, in diverse manners, you know, they, they, they had prophets, you know, they had kings, they had priests. Um, they had flaming bushes. They had uh, talking donkeys. You know, there's all sorts of ways that information about God came to, to people in the past, in the past. But then the final and clear revelation came, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, we had the final revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And when the scriptures were completed, we had the full and complete and final revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ meaning he came as a revelation of God. Now we have the scriptures, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ. We have it all. Paul didn't have that. And Paul knew that. So Paul was constantly growing in different ways. And we think, oh, he just he arrived and he's writing scripture. He didn't have the scriptures. He was writing them. So Martin Luther says this, without Christ, God cannot be found, known, or comprehended. And we know Christ now through the completed scriptures. But even Paul pressed on. So he had not arrived. And we must press on too. But we have everything that we possibly need to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, everything. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is how that revelation of the Word of God is applied to our hearts. If you're like me, and I pray that you are not, you may have spent weeks, years, decades wondering about how the Word of God works in us. I'm going to tell you, I spent many years as a Christian. I had studied a lot, went to different Bible colleges, and one time, almost like it was like I should have known this all along, one time a professor said, you know, what is the Holy Spirit's job with Scripture? I was like, well, I don't know. And the whole class was like, we don't know. He says, the Holy Spirit, when you're reading scripture, illuminates the scripture and illuminates your heart. 
there's a special interaction that happens when we read the scripture if we allow the Holy Spirit to work. Did I mention, I think I did, that there are some people that have been contacting me lately about different things. You know, multiple people. I'm not trying to lift myself up when I say multiple people, but there's just different ones. And when you get a call and you get somebody saying to you, I just had the scripture come alive to me like never before. You realize that for the first time, people are realizing that there is actually something going on that is outside of them, actually within them, that is helping them to grow in grace and the knowledge of, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they're realizing that there's a power there, a power that is far surpassing anything we could ever hope or imagine for. It's the power of the Holy Spirit using the word of God to change us. And we have all we need. It's the scripture. Now that's our foundation. That's our foundation. When we look at Paul, we think, oh, he's an amazing preacher. He, he did start preaching right away. But as Pastor Andy mentioned to me, probably I'm going to say six to eight weeks ago, maybe over the summer, six months ago, he, he mentioned this passage in Acts, and we're going to turn there. And he said, you know, I haven't really, I think he said, I, I haven't really studied this too much, but, you know, the, look at the sequence of events. And then, and then look over in this other scripture uh, of what he says later. And quite frankly, when I went to, to prepare this message, I, I'm like, I, I don't remember what, wh where he said what he was talking about, but I started searching and searching, and not only did I find what he was mentioning those six months ago, but it spoke to me also. So let's read Acts 17, 1 through, we're going to read Acts 17, 1 through, uh, maybe about 22. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, whom coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
It will continue. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious or too religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he gives to all life and breath in all things, and hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are offspring of God, we ought not, not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or, and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commends all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius and Arabagat and a woman named Damaris and others with them. The question is, why did we read that whole section? Well, a few things happen in there. And if you just read through it very quickly, you might not see it. Paul basically speaks and preaches to three different people, three different groups of people. Um, in the first instance, um, there's quite a few that believe. It said, of women, not a few, meaning a lot. And so he had a pretty good response from preaching Christ and Christ crucified. In fact, the response was so good that they were angry with him for doing it. And what did Paul have to do? He had to get skedaddle. The second group, the same thing happened. There was a bunch of people that got saved. I think that's in um, Acts, uh, uh, I think it's verse 12. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot that are saved. In the third group, they're expecting Paul to come up and preach Christ crucified. But Paul goes to Mars Hill, and he changes his game plan. And again, Pastor Andy's the one that brought this up to me. I think he said he wanted to study it more. I'm not trying to say he, you know, he said this or this is what he firmly held, but Paul changes his game plan. He's in the midst of people that are extremely smart. So he wants to go there, and he, you know, he sort of wants to meet them where they're at, and he preaches a different message. A message, quite frankly, if you read the message, Christians and believers look at it like, yeah, you know, you're getting it, you know, this is awesome, how he's taking philosophy, and he's, and he's reworking it into uh, how to use that as a testimony. The problem is, hardly anybody gets saved. So few people get saved from Paul arguing and disputing uh, that they're, they're pretty much named by name at the end of it. You know, before it's like not a few women and a bunch of people over here and they went here. But in this group, just a few, very few. And nobody's upset with him. Nobody cares that he's done that. In fact, they're like, we will listen to him again. And I know a preacher who used to preach messages that were pretty rock solid. And he preached them in ways that were pretty forceful. And he said sometimes he would go in the back, and when people were leaving, somebody would come and shake his hand and say, enjoyed it. And he would say, that's exactly what I don't want somebody to say. Now, I'm not going to pick on that. And I don't think he was really picking on that. But what he wanted from his messages is somebody to be encouraged. He wanted somebody to be equipped. He wanted somebody to be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit to change their life, to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What he didn't want is somebody to be like, yeah, enjoyed it. That was great. Next time I'll bring popcorn and a soda and I'll enjoy it more. That's what the philosophers were saying. This Paul's an interesting fellow. We'll listen to him again. You know, set him up again. You know, have him come back. They didn't change, they just enjoyed it. 
And why does this become important? Or why is this important? Because as Pastor Andy pointed out, and as I looked at dates and things, this was probably occurred right around 53 AD. In 55 AD, Paul writes the letter to the Corinthian church. So as we move over to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, we could read a lot more, but we're going to start at verse 18, and we're going to go probably to chapter 2, verse 5. And again, if you want, a, you want a good sermon straight from Scripture, read this. Listen to what Paul says after arguing with the men at Mars Hill, being a, a philosopher of his own right, being a, he, he knew the Scriptures very well, and he could argue. But this is what he says about all of his human wisdom and knowledge and power. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save some save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made known is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was extremely smart in the flesh, Paul was extremely powerful. And I believe what Paul realized was that when he changed his mode of evangelization, when he changed his mode of ministering from Christ crucified and Christ resurrected, that it might have seemed wonderful, but there was absolutely no power there. So it's interesting to me, I'll just call it interesting, that while I love creation versus evolution, I used to study it. I have books, and, and I, I love to study it. It's interesting to me that when, they talk, when God talks about it in the scriptures in Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrews 11, when he talks about the great faith, men of faith, and how faith is necessary, the scriptures itself says, by faith we understand. I won't get this quote right. By faith we understand the worlds were created from nothing. We can have all the scientific information we want, and you can present all the scientific information that you want to anybody. You can meet them at their level. David Bolton House, Bolton David Heiser, I think is his name. It's either David Bolton Heiser or Heiser, but I don't know. Bolton David Heiser, I think is his name. Extremely brilliant man, wrote an extremely thick 400, 500 page book filled with all sorts of scientific information why creation is real and evolution is not. Now I realize we know people with last name Ham and Hovind and other ones like that that have written all like that. This guy was, I, I'm just going to tell you, this guy was probably a couple steps above them with scientific knowledge. But that doesn't, that's not going to prove anything to anybody. 
because it's by faith we understand that the world was made. And again, why do I say this uh, when we're talking about growing in grace and knowledge of our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Because at some point, we can say to ourselves, with how we minister to others, how we grow, how we evangelize, we can throw away everything that we are. As smart as we think we are, as philosophic as we think we are, as crafty as we think we are, we can throw it away. We can become nothing. And God can build us up in our most holy faith through Christ and Christ crucified. It is the humbling of ourselves to nothing that the Lord will lift us up, not in our own strength, not in our own power, but in his power and his strength. Is pride not a big issue? So what kicked, you know, we talk about sins, and <clears throat> some of them are pretty, you know, embarrassing. Some of them are pretty devastating. Some of them have devastating consequences. Some of us, we would be embarrassed to admit to somebody else that we had that thought or that we had that predilection, even if we didn't act upon it, or we engaged in that. And you know how devastating that can be. I think all of us, in one way, shape, or another, know how devastating that can be. But the thing that kicked Satan out of heaven, the thing that keeps us from growing the most in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, our, is probably our pride. And when we can humble ourselves, if we can humble ourselves before the word of God. Now, I haven't gotten to this level yet. This is next level stuff. And, and quite frankly, I'll tell you one reason why I don't do this. Because <clears throat> I'm afraid I would start worshiping the Bible rather than yielding to the Bible. But Mueller and others, and I believe they, they did it properly. I don't think I'm there yet. They said when they studied the scripture, they would put it on maybe a little table that big. And they would kneel in front of it to read it. Why? Humility. Humility. You know, we often wonder how these giants of the faith built orphanages that would have two and 3,000 people, had ministries among the Indians. David Brainerd died at 29 years of age. If you're 29 years of age or under, you probably have twice as, you probably have the same amount of time he lived to now continue to minister at your age. You, have, you can probably miss her another 29 years if you're 29 years old and still have plenty of years left. He missed her. That means, what did he do? He humbled himself. Had an amazing ministry. It's humility. And Paul, and this is what I'm saying, with the growth and grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we see that Paul realized that he needed to press on. Not that I've arrived. I see with a veil now, there's going to be other people past me that are going to have more at their disposal to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than I do. If Paul needed to grow, if Paul put himself under the authority of the Holy Spirit, now he didn't have the scriptures, but if he did that, we also ought to do the same. It's humility. And then he will raise us up. So, how do we witness then? Well, what does he say? We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, unto the Greeks, foolishness. Now, what we like to do, and I'll give you a hint, we might not get to the third part of the message, which is fine, I knew that might happen. Um, what we like to do is we like to say, I have a better way of doing this. I think Paul had to grow toward humbling himself to preach Christ and Christ crucified and not rely on his philosophy, not rely on his wisdom, not rely on his power. 
but we like to, you know, we like to take that stumbling block and we like to smooth it out. So we know somebody who uh, was going to do some ministry um, amongst a different people group, amongst a different culture. And they, they wrote in their letter, support letter, I don't blame them, just so you know, I don't blame that person because they're young and they've been taught this. But they said, we're not going to preach the gospel or we're not going to do, yeah, basically that's what they said, we're not going to preach the gospel. They said, because this people group doesn't respond to that, so we're going to tell them stories. So they were trying to you know, smooth out the stumbling block. And I think, too, myself included, we try to smooth out some of these stumbling blocks and say, well, you know, I'm going to minister the gospel this way with this person because I don't think they can accept, you know, the same gospel that saved me. So we try to smooth that out. And, and, and then we, we try to think, well, you know, these people are, are, are really smart and I ought to, you know, study all of these you know, scientific things so that, you know, I can answer all of these scientific questions when in reality, what saves people is the gospel. What saves people is the gospel. And so we have to humble ourselves because we have to realize that while we think we know better, while we think we can shave down that stumbling block, when we think we can lift ourselves up so that we can meet people, you know, on a higher intellectual level, we need to humble ourselves because the Bible says we preach Christ and Christ crucified. And then what happens, if you read this whole section, what happens, man's power and man's wisdom is thrown out the door. And God's power and God's wisdom reigns as we yield to that. So we don't have to do anything except for obey. You know, we had to stick to the script, so to speak. Why? Because as we stick to the script, then the Holy Spirit will do the work. Because we can argue all we want. We can have a great philosophical argument. We can meet them where they're at scientifically. We can do all of those things, and it will accomplish exactly zero. Because it was in my wisdom and my strength and my power, and I didn't allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. It's interesting to me that when you talk about success, su successful people talk about how they became successful, you know, black, white, woman, men, you know, people that came from families that were well-to-do and people that came from families that had nothing. They will constantly say it was hard work that got me there. And yet you have a generation of people that want to make it easy for people to do the same thing that it took them strength and fortitude and determination to get there. I'm thinking, why take that grit and determination away? But we do the same thing. Because if you look back to how you came to know the Lord, if you're truly saved, it was by the power of the Holy Spirit and somebody ministering the gospel of grace to you. Like, for a while, I think I didn't like tracks. Do you know how I got saved? A track. <laughs> but all of a sudden, that's not good enough for anybody else. And, and again, I'm not saying tracks is the only way, but what we need to do is, like Paul, he became resolute that he would preach Christ and Christ crucified. Foolishness, a stumbling block. But the wisdom and power of God. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. The cross of Christ is the love of God. That's the difference. That's the difference. And we need to humble ourselves for that. So it's his wisdom and his power. So we're going to stop there. But I do want to mention the third part of the growth. And I'm, I'm very grateful for... John Van Gelderen, and one of his messages. I can't remember which one it was. But when we look at Paul, we think, well, he, he had it all together. Remember, Paul in Romans, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, Paul lived a carnal, I, I believe, and I, we've talked about this with a few people here, 
Paul lived a carnal life as a Christian. You're like, why do you mean carnal life? Well, I don't think he was going to, you know, to, to prostitutes. I don't think he was drinking and doing drugs. And I don't think he was swearing like a sailor. Paul lived a carnal life, I believe, after he became a Christian. It's pretty clear from Romans 5 through 8, if you read it, um, that, and John Van Geldering, again, has a great message on this, but he went on his own strength and own power. That's where the carnality came in. And I think Paul slowly, over the course of a few years, five, ten, whatever it was, slowly realized that he needed to give over and yield his power, his strength, his might, his wisdom, and rely on the Spirit's power. Rely on the Spirit's power and his alone. So if we had more time, we would see in 56 to 58 AD, Paul came to that place where at one point he realized that he had no power over sin. You know, we're saved from the penalty of sin when we get saved. But we're also saved from the power of sin when we're saved. And there's a lot of people that don't, don't realize that. We will only be saved from the presence of sin when we get to heaven. But we're saved from the power of sin. But I believe Paul didn't realize that, as Van Gellering said. Again, I'm not trying to steal his message. But he said, you know, that which I do not want to do, that's exactly what I do. You know, I don't want to sin, and I end up doing it. And <clears throat> the things which I do want to do, those good things, you know, I want to do those things, and, and there's a, a stop there, and I can't do them. Why? Because in his flesh dwells no good thing. But then he realized, who will save me from this body of sin? Not only to keep himself from sinning, but who will save me from this body of sin so that I might go out in liberty and preach and teach, not by my strength and not by my wisdom, but by the Spirit's wisdom, it was Jesus Christ. And that's, again, as we conclude, where the growth and grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes in. It's a perpetual growth. It's an everyday growth. It's a Holy Spirit empowered growth. And the way to do it is to yield to the Word of God because that's how we can know Christ and know him better. Let's pray. Again, our heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you and praise you for the glory of your name, for your goodness to us, and that you meet us where we're at. So we pray, Lord, that we would not stay um, in our spiritual state. We pray, Lord, that we would grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts and show us where we are errant and help us, Lord, then to yield uh, so that we might see your power in, through, and around us. Help us to be ever hungry for the word of God, ever thirsty uh, for Christ who is all power, all wisdom. Again, we lift up this time to you. We trust that that which is said that is true would stick in our hearts and that your power would be seen in and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer requests. Prayer requests. Yes. Christy. Praise. praise the Lord. Okay. He has um, I'm going to tell you exactly what it's called echolasia which I guess it's a rare less than 200,000 US cases per year um, it is similar to the symptoms obviously and it puts him more at risk for esophageal cancer but he could be medically free okay. so if you could please pray what's his name again? David David, okay Praise the Lord. Yes. Prayer requests and praises. I absolutely will take praises too. Brian. Uh, you can just continue to pray for Christy's dad as he's in and out of the hospital and for me and his uh, rehab studies and now for his return to find you so that you can uh, nurse him home for him. Uh, help him stop this after a long wait. And it's been just getting to the point he can't do things for himself. And it's very hard for smaller women. Yesterday, working with him, we, we prayed together and we asked for his, his hope 
Mm-hmm. I've had two instances now. I can't remember the second one, but very quickly, uh, uh, Christmas or New Year's Eve, a forklift driver who was older than me and, and wanted nothing to do with Christianity had, had a stroke. Uh, another worker accused them of just wanting to go home early to go to parties. He ended up going to the hospital, and I went in that night. And I was a young Christian. I, I didn't know any. I was, you know, didn't know, didn't know anything. And um, what struck me was that his son was there, and this guy's you know maybe dying. And uh, visiting hours were about to be over, and the man who was in bed said to his son, "Can you leave? I want." And he called me a pastor or something like that. I want, you want Jeff to say, you know, whatever. I wasn't a pastor or anything like that. And um, he said, I want, I want you to pray for me. At that moment, you realize that a guy that doesn't want anything to do with Jesus would rather the guy he picked on for being a Christian to be in the room with him and kick his son out and pray with him. And that was powerful. And I, th- I thought, I shouldn't be here. Your son should still be here. That's what my mind was thinking. But just goes to show you all the picking that people do on you. They want, they want it. They might not even know they want it, but they want it. Other prayer requests. Hearing no prayer requests, the women can stay here for prayer, and the men can go downstairs. <laughs>